we welcome you all to this session. I think we still have a minute, so be patient with us. Okay. I would like to welcome each and every one of us to today's session. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all speakers and participants joining us from across the globe. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the ongoing online training workshop on advancing innovation, a government innovation and leveraging volunteer technologies for disaster risk reduction and building resilience. My name is Dana Samuel. I'm an associate capacity development associate um, uh, experts with the United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs, UNPOG. I will be the moderator for today's section four on data and digital government for disaster risk reduction and building resilience. Kindly note that today's session consists of four thematic presentations, two country presentations from Japan and the Philippines. And uh, we have a Q&A discussion session to be moderated by my colleague, Mr. Kepin Yao. Participants are kindly requested to send us your comments and questions through the Q&A button on your screen. And you can also send us greetings from uh, through the chat box telling us wherever you are joining us from. I would like to kindly let you also know that uh, this, uh, currently we have over, um, uh, a, a couple of uh, participants joining us now, and this ongoing workshop has been registered by over 300 participants from over 70 countries, and we still uh, will continue whilst waiting on them to join. So without much ado, I will just proceed on inviting uh, my colleague, Kepin Yao, to deliver a presentation, an overview presentation on data and digital government for disaster risk reduction. Uh, Mr. Yao or Mr. Kepin Yao is a senior governance and public administration expert with the United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs here in Incheon. Mr. Yao, you may have the floor. Thank you, Dana. Yeah. Yes. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. So I will present uh, the part on the data for DR. Actually, this is a very big issue. 10 minutes is really far from enough. So, but I will try, yeah. Data is important for evidence-based policy design and decision-making, as well as the monitoring and review of a policy recommendation, policy implementation, sorry. Data has become the most valuable asset in the digital era. Data, even more, data is even more critical for DRR due to the rapidly evolving situation and the multi-facetted complexities during disasters. DR requires uh, real-time quality and interdisciplinary data. And also with the advancement of high performance computing, cloud computing, big data and data analytics tools like artificial intelligence, data has created much value added for forecasting and predicting risk simulation assessment, automated or augmented decision making. Uh, you all know that uh, uh, we, uh, Develop this kind of toolkit on the in risk informed governance and the innovative technology for DR and resilience. And the data is also cross cutting uh, in the toolkit. The toolkit addresses a full range of data issues, including data requirements, data types, open and big data and big data analytics, data presentation, citizen science, social media data, and data mining, and also AI and machine learning policies governing data data ownership and the privacy and the data for monitoring and evaluation with the R policy implementation. Uh, it, in, uh, it, it is covered in modules 1.1 and 1.2 and 2.4, and 2.5 and all three modules in part three. So I will not cover all aspects of the data issues. Please uh, refer to the toolkit uh, for uh, further in-depth understanding of the critical rule of data for the R. Uh, in the meantime, we also look forward to receiving your comments and the feedback for improving toolkit. Yeah, next please. So today I will talk about the data for data-driven decision making and also understanding the data requirements and the challenges 
open government data for DR, strengthening data governance, and also policy recommendations. Next, please. Data-driven decision-making should be applied across all the, SD, uh, all the SDGs. Also, data-driven governance requires availability of high-quality, timely, and reliable, reliable data. Next, please. Among the four priorities for uh, in the Syndex framework, one, the first priority is understanding disaster risk. It is specifically required assessing and updating the current state of data, scientific and local and indigenous knowledge on DRR and fill the gaps with new knowledge. It also requires scientific data and information to support monitoring and reviewing progress towards the DRR and resilience building. Next, please. As we discussed over previous sessions, the disaster risk is rapidly emerging to be systemic. It requires a robust, timely, accurate, desegregated, people-centered, and accessible information. It also requires data from different domains. We need to integrate traditional and non-traditional data. Next, please. Data is the foundation during four phases of a DRR, especially for the mitigation and the prevention. And the monitoring and the early warning also requires real-time data. For recovery, we need data for disaster loss assessment, which we also addressed in the session two by the Chinese experts. And also, we also need data for post-disaster reconstruction planning. Next, please. With the new data technologies, the importance of open data, big data, especially mobile data network and social media data, and big data analytics is rising significantly. Governments are also experimenting with the data analytic tools and a different data modeling. Next, please. Actually, better use of the data is not a privilege for developed countries. Developing countries, and especially those vulnerable countries prone to disasters, should be equipped with expertise and skills to better leverage the power of data for DRR. Bangladesh, for example, uh, itself, it's uh, one of the LDCs. They have been very aggressive in using the data for evidence-based decision-making, including DRR. For example, they developed a predictive model to take timely decisions by integrating data from different sources. Next, please. For better understanding the terminology related to the government data, I started this table from the UN e-government survey to 2020 for better categorization. Among those data types, like public data, government data, census and survey data, administrative data, and open government data, I would like to highlight the importance of the census and survey data. It includes the household survey, like civil res registration for digital ID, and raptor loss assessment, the population census with the disaggregated data by ages and gender. Many countries have uh, neglected the importance of, of administrative data. Actually, the administrative data like tax records, records, business register, data on public services transactions, like application for renewal of a driver license, education records, are very important data sources. So it requires full data information sharing to avoid duplication data collection and reducing the data reporting burdens. Also about open government data, which I will full, fully full, full address later. It is about uh, the data collected and stored by the government and also generated from its operations. Yeah. The open government data can, could be also big data collected by government, such as precipitation and the temperature and the water level. Next, please. About a big data and a big data analytics, uh, it will be further addressed by our speaker from Pacific Disaster Center a little bit later. It will be also uh, has been fully addressed in the toolkit as well. For the geospatial data, which is important for DRR, our speaker from NASA in session two has a talk about the old observation science and technology for collecting geospatial data, old systems and modeling potential risks. He specifically mentioned that maximize the value of a front tech technology for DRR 
requires new observing strategies and new analytical frameworks. And also real-time data can reduce the time lag in the responses. Yeah? Social media data with location-based information and social media crowdsourcing can be used for fast state of the tracking with great details. Next, please. Countries have been experimenting with new data sources, innovation, innovative data partnership, data exchange, and new data technologies. So in this slide, you can see those countries are experimenting the new uh, initiatives. Uh, for example, uh, in EU and Japan, they're exploring uh, the innovative um, data sharing across agencies, yeah. Uh, Public-private data partnership, yeah. Next, please, yeah. Also, in part two, I would like to talk about understanding the data requirements and the challenges. Information will be always not so impact, imperfect uh, perfect and incomplete. So it requires uh, data cleaning and integration. Next, please. And also for mitigation planning data, we also uh, need the hazard exposure data, hazard likelihood data, and anticipated consequence data. Also for the hazard monitoring and warning data, it requires a dynamic real-time data, and also it may be automated or require human surveys. Next, please. Also the response, next please. Also the response and recovery also requires that the current data, data and information from diverse stakeholders and also requires data for situation assessment, this assessment, yeah, next please. Also, uh, there's a, a bunch of challenges uh, for data. Uh, the typically they could data availability and quality and also barriers to risk communication and also lack of data interoperability and people uh, lack of data literacy to fully understand the information and also data collection of fragmented. We have a data sellers and also data innovation uh, must be uh, further mainstreamed and also digital divide always a big issue. We need to investment uh, in ICD infrastructure. Next please, yeah. And also we have uh, those kind of traditional or typical data sharing challenges like a lack of leadership and also we have uh, incident barriers, poor data quality and also a uh, uh, lack of organizational policies for data sharing. Next, please. I will talk about this uh, open government data. Uh, actually, governments have taken stock of huge amount of data on environment, climate, constraint permits, forest, geographic flood uh, risk assessment, land use planning, and all the uh, flood uh, assessment data. So these are very important sources of academia, CSOs, and IT business to be engaged. Next, please. And also now more and more countries has the national, data, uh, national open government data portals. Next, please. Yeah. And for example, Japan, if you search a disaster, it has more than 2,400 data sets. Next, please. And also in the UK, open government data portal, if you search the flood, flood the risk areas, you give it a, a full range of uh, those kind of data sets uh, about flood risk. Next, please. So uh, the flood risk assessment data has been open since early uh, 2014. It ha has helped the local communities develop local flood warning systems and protect themselves. Next, please. Next, I will briefly talk about the data governance. So data governance is a systematic approach to setting policies, strategies, data systems, and the technologies. It includes initiatives with regard to data generation, reporting, and results dissemination and data innovation. The data governance actually enables the environment of sharing data, linked data, interoperability, and the data exchange facilities. Next, please. So among uh, this kind of uh, four pillars, we have four pillars of policies, regulation, the national strategy, and data access system, and data technologies. Some key elements include national digital ID, data protection, and privacy. Next, please. Hello, also, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, please, could you be round it up? Yes. Yeah, one minute, I'll wrap up, yeah. So, and Thank also you. OECD, uh, I also have a, a classify the data governance in three layers, and a strategic layers, tactical layer, layers, and delivery layer. And also this one is about this uh, 
uh, different uh, rules of different institutions is also consistent with the OECD classification of different layers. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. And also about the data privacy, it's also very important. So we have to take care of it, especially we are using more mobile data networking. Next, please. And also, yeah, it's about the global and the regional uh, policy initiative related to the data governance. Yeah. And also some recommendations briefly, it's about the data demand evolving. So we should encourage more data innovation. Data desegregation is needed. And also we need to better use open government data. And also we need to the, uh, better partnership with all stakeholders. We need to strengthen data governance, especially for protection of data privacy. And also some international partnership is needed for data sharing and coordination. And lastly, we need to have new approaches to investment in data capacity and ICD infrastructure. Thank you, Dana. Thank you very much, Kepin, for such a great delivery and a comprehensive presentation. Uh, I especially realize your presentation highlighted on the need for data, especially data innovation, disaggregated data, data governance, and uh, the enormous benefits we get from data. And uh, it's a kind of a revealing moments for us to better leverage data for disaster risk reduction and resilience. I will now proceed to deliver the second part of uh, the overview presentation that will focus on um, the uh, digital government for disaster risk reduction. So uh, next slide, please. It should be noted, okay, the presentation is going to take this outline. Please next. Next slide, please. This is the first part of the presentation. So it should be noted that digital government has an increasing important role to play in supporting countries and endeavors to be able to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs and particularly disaster risk reduction. Digital government and e-government have been used interchangeably since there has not been any distinctive uh, definition or uh, declaring or separating both. But it should be noted that digital government or e-government broadly refers to ICT use for improving public services. Next slide, please. Digital government has emerged as a powerful tool for ensuring disaster risk reduction and building resilience. And uh, digital government is supposed to help and has helped in improving public service delivery improve citizens' engagement, transparency, accountability, and even promoting inclusion among citizens. Next slide, please. Digital government, and particularly ICTs, have helped predict uh, disasters through early warning system, and it's also helping in a disaster response, and has been very much uh, related to all the phases of the disaster risk management cycle, be it response, be it the preparedness stage, risk reduction, prevention, and uh, recovery, and even helping in building back better. Next slide, please. Disaster, our digital government also has the ability to enhance uh, e-resilience. Easy resilience uh, generally refers to ICT's contribution to resilience and particularly building stronger uh, resilience at the community level. And mainstreaming e-resilience in all the phases of the disaster risk management requires the concerted efforts of all key stakeholders and policymakers to be able to make the right decisions. Next slide, please. E-resilience requires or has a guiding principle and this guiding principle, according to the ACN Pacific Disaster Report, states five essential steps that are required in enhancing e-resilience. And it starts from the bottom, which is understanding the risks, install, uh, installing data and information sharing, till we get to using real-time information. So from the pre-disaster stage to the post-disaster stage, uh, e-resilience has this guiding principles for us. Next slide, please. It is also important to reiterate the fact that ICTs contribute enormously and is very important to all the phases of the disaster risk management uh, process as mentioned. Next slide, please. I'll now move to the need for bridging the data divide. 
And uh, while digital government and ICTs are very important to ensuring disaster risk reduction and also building resilience, unfortunately, however, there exists a wide digital divide across societies. It is therefore important to work on bridging this digital inequality. Digital divide broadly refers to the gap that exists amongst groups, among societies, and amongst regions of the world. Next slide, please. The very first step in bridging the digital divide is by addressing the systemic inequalities that exist in our society and bridging those in area of uh, limited resources, uh, weak infrastructure base, and even insufficient capacities. Next slide, please. It is important to note that bridging the digital divide to ensure the inclusion and in all of all requires development of digital government capacities. So developing capacities are very important. Strengthening digital capacities will invariably help bridge this divide and ensure there is digital inclusion across society, and especially to help achieve uh, the 2030 agenda of leaving no one behind. Developing capacity for digital government must be purpose-driven and pursued with the intervention of bridging these gaps among and across all groups in our society. So promoting digital divide would therefore require a holistic approach to digital government, which is captured in this uh, diagram. Next slide, please. I will now proceed to share with you some innovative cases on how digital divide is being leveraged uh, in some selected uh, societies for disaster risk reduction and resilience. So one is the case on the finder. Uh, many victims are often trapped under massive rubbles when disasters occur, especially in times like uh, earthquakes. And during this period, people are usually trapped, but they are not being able to get identified. But this technology is able to sense and provide, it has an infra infrared system that helps to be able to identify and sense people's heartbeat. And this is how digital government is being leveraged to build resilience and also in terms or in times of disaster risk reduction. Next slide, please. The next case focuses on the Malawi drone uh, corridor program, uh, which was established in 2017 by the government of Malawi in partnership with UNICEF. And this has helped bring together all uh, partners or stakeholders to be able to develop their capacities to enhance their ability to be able to respond to humanitarian needs, especially uh, targeting vulnerable groups. And this goal has identified, it was identified as helping the poorest and reaching the most vulnerable families in Malawi. Next slide, please. The next uh, case is about the use of LIDAR mapping system in Samoa. Uh, the government of Samoa adopted this technology or created a national adaptation program of action known as NAPA. And that, has, that is able to help guide the country's climate change adaptation effort. And risk assessment that has uh, identified settlements, especially those very close to low lying areas and vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And this has uh, enormously or have been very much able to help these communities uh, through by adopting digital government. Next slide, please. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate the fact that digital government shouldn't be an end in itself. It's a means to improving public services delivery. Digital government plays a central and a key role in addressing all manner of crisis that behoves or comes around in our society. To be able to achieve the su sustainable development goals, ICTs play a key role. And in as much as ICT plays a key role, it also helps in building resilient communities. So ICTs should, is very much interconnected with the SDGs and can help accelerate the achievement of uh, the sustainable development goals vis-a-vis -vis helping uh, ensuring resilient societies. And uh, digital governments should be seen as a journey and not a destination. The continuous monitoring and evaluation of digital government uh, services is very, very important and essential. Thank you very much for your attention. I will now proceed uh, to invite our second presenter, 
uh, which will be delivered by Mr. Ko, Mr. Kionko. Uh, his presentation will focus on ICT's application for disaster risk reduction and resilience. I know this is much uh, cut crossing with what I did, but he's going to provide more in depth uh, piece. Mr. Ko is the director of the UN ACN and Pacific Training Center for ICT for, develop, uh, for development. Mr. Ko was previously the vice president and head of office of the Korea Telecom, and he has been engaged in many telecom issues, business development and resource mobilization, both in and overseas. Mr. Ko holds a PhD in technology policy from Yonsei University, a master's degree in economic systems and operations from Stanford University, and a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from University of Colorado. Mr. Ko, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Donna, for your thank um, you. detailed uh, introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to learn, uh, learning a lot from this webinar as well, and thank you uh, for inviting me. My name is Kion Ko, again, uh, Director of UN APCICT, Asia Pacific Training Center for ICT for Development. Uh, we are a, a specialized ICT capacity building institution under UNESCO. Next slide. Hmm. Uh, our mandate is to build a human and institutional ICT capacity for our member states. And in order to achieve our mandate, we do uh, three major activities. First, capacity building. Uh, second, we provide technical assistance to our member states. And three, uh, we pro provide uh, e-learning and knowledge uh, sharing platforms. Next slide. Uh, we have uh, uh, three specific uh, target uh, audience groups. First is policymakers and government officers. Second is women entrepreneurs and related stakeholders. And third group is uh, future leaders. And we have a specialized, uh, specially designed uh, program for each target group. For policymakers, we call Academy. For women, we call uh, Women ICT Frontier Initiative, Wi-Fi for short, and Primer for Young Leaders. Um, in, uh, for Academy for Policymakers, um, many countries officially integrate our program into their curriculum of uh, national uh, civil service uh, training institutions. Next slide. And uh, this Academy for Postmakers, we have four theme categories. And one of the categories is uh, borderless issues, transponder issues. And uh, in that category, we have a uh, module training module called ICT for disaster risk management. As you can see uh, in this slide, the cover of the module. And this module um, consists of uh, eight uh, chapters uh, covering uh, all phases of DRM cycle plus uh, gender issues. And uh, what I'm going to uh, explain, present now is excerpt from uh, this module. Next slide. Uh, this is a diagram for uh, explaining a DRM cycle and uh, red colored parts are activities uh, closely related ICT technology applications. So we can say ICT, as Donna mentioned, uh, ICT plays quite a crucial role in all phases of DRM. Next slide. Uh, disaster uh, risk is a spatial uh, problem. So uh, geospatial data is important in all phases of the DRM cycle, understanding, analyzing, and communicating. ICT can help not only to collect data, but also analyze and disseminate. Next slide. There are three uh, important ICT applications for DRM. First is uh, satellite remote sensing. Uh, Earth's uh, observation satellites provides a sub, uh, sub middle level data with a very detailed information and also contributes to a post disaster response activities. Uh, communication satellites are being used in disaster preparedness activities as well. Next slide. Another uh, application is a global navigation satellite system called GNSS. GNSS enabled service are being used for disaster preparedness activities such as a monitoring of Earth's movement and sending early warning to remote location, etc. And also 
being used for disaster response activities. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of uh, sending early warning using GNSS. Uh, Japanese uh, COSC GNSS uh, satellite system uh, is uh, supporting short messaging facilities for early warnings in Japan. Okay, next slide. The third ap application, important application of, for DRM is a geographical information system called the GIS. And this uh, system is used in all phases of the DRM cycle. And this system provides a platform to analyze and integrate data coming from the various sources and prepare a specific tools for all phases DRM. Next slide. And this is a, a quite well-known uh, web-based GIS system called GeoNode, sponsored by World Bank. And this, a, this is a, a geospatial content management system, a platform for the management and publication of uh, ge geospatial data. Next slide. Uh, under um, mitigation and prevention phase, uh, risk is uh, risk is communicated through ICT uh, tools and technology, uh, including uh, social media and mobile apps, as well as conventional uh, ICT um, communication tools. Next slide. Under uh, preparedness uh, phase, uh, ICTs are quite heavily used in the monitoring, alarm, warning, forecasting, and outcasting systems. Next slide. Um, this is an example for alert and evacuation. Uh, this app is mobile, it's called the Shake Alert app, uh, developed in California. And that this uh, app uh, alerts the users uh, how many seconds before shaking waves arrive and uh, what's the intensity of the, of the wave. And also this uh, displays a map uh, showing the location of the epicenter, magnitude, et cetera, is quite handy. Next slide. Under uh, disaster response stage, uh, this is an example uh, for a dynamic emergency response maps um, for 2017 Sri Lanka uh, plus. And um, this not only shows uh, satellite images, but also uh, shows a real-time photographs from small phones from um, volunteers in nearby the uh, uh, affected area to show the extent of damage. Next slide. Um, this is um, ICT use for um, recovery stage, and this is a earthquake damage assessment uh, using optical remote sensing images. This is case uh, in Haiti uh, in 2010. Next slide. Okay, uh, about uh, gender issues. Um, there's um, uh, the movement, strong movement toward a mainstreaming gender issue into DRR, uh, such as women-focused approach to gender-focused, uh, reactive, to long-term proactive action. Um, you probably all agree, uh, ICT has changed the way in how we communicate, how we access and share information. So if ICT can be used in a gender sensitive way, um, such as uh, using a gender disaggregate data uh, and analyzed by ICT tools, ICT, ICT can help uh, narrow the economic and social gaps between uh, women and uh, men under disaster situation. Next slide. Uh, this is an uh, excerpt from UN ASCAP's Asia Pacific Disaster uh, Report 2019 and uh, uh, powered by uh, advanced technology searches such as artificial intelligence uh, geared by uh, machine learning function and uh, coupled with um, big data comes from uh, sensors, uh, drone images, IoT, and uh, social media 
uh, a, a smaller uh, DRM uh, can be uh, achieved. So, uh, next slide. Um, this is an example uh, using big data and uh, machine learning uh, by a Google Public uh, Alert program. And uh, the, this, uh, this app generates maps and runs up to hundreds of thousands of uh, simulations in each location to accurately predict uh, not only uh, when and where the flood might occur, but the severity of the event as well. Uh, the an animation is gone, but anyway, uh, you can get the idea. Uh, from the uh, from the image uh, on your left hand side. Okay, and next slide. Uh, this uh, concludes my presentation, short presentation. And uh, if you are interested uh, in our uh, training program, please uh, visit our website as shown uh, in this slide. Thank you very much for listening. Back to you, Donna. Thank you so much, Mr. Ko, for such an excellent presentation. And uh, your presentation particularly highlighted the need for ICT in understanding risks, analyzing risks, and communicating risks. And what particularly caught my attention was that if ICTs can be used in a gender-sensitive way, ICT can help narrow the economic and social gaps between men and women. So this calls for gender uh, mainstreaming ICTs in uh, gender into an ICT system. So I will now proceed to our next presenter and she will be delivering a presentation on bridging digital divide and building resilience for disaster risk reduction and, and res resilience. Uh, I have the opportunity to welcome Ms. Atuko Okuda. Ms. Okuda is the regional director at the International Telecom Union uh, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific based in Thailand a position she assumed this year in April. And prior to this role, she was the chief of ICT and development section at UNSCAP, also based in Bangkok. And she has previously worked with uh, the United Nations Economic and Social uh, Commission for Western Asia, ESWA. And she holds a master's in, uh, from Helsinki University in Finland a bachelor's degree from Kyoto University in Japan, and currently enrolled as a research fellow on governance at the United Nations University in the Netherlands. Ms. Okuda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dana. Um, next slide, please. Thank you for inviting me to this very important uh, seminar. This topic is very dear to my heart. And let me start my presentation on this background. In uh, 2018, for the e-government survey 2018, I actually contributed a chapter, uh, the chapter three, which is called e-resilience through e-government because uh, I believe that this is a very timely topic for Asia and the Pacific, which is disproportionately affected by natural disasters. And in fact, uh, Mr. Dana presented some of the tables that con was contained in this chapter. And I was very um, uh, uh, appreciative of uh, you sharing the, uh, the information on this concept which I believe is very important. So in the end of this chapter, uh, there was a few highlights for the way forward. And my presentation basically will, uh, it was developed around these uh, topics on uh, where we were left um, on this particular topic. One is, the, is that um, the risk and vulnerability assessment was important, but we need to really break it down to infrastructure, data, application facilities, and communities at risk, and should build these building blocks to make it happen. And two, the awareness raising on emerging, emerging technologies were identified as important, as uh, Mr. Kapin uh, highlighted there are great significant opportunities using IoT, big data, cloud computing, and uh, uh, AI in particular. However, if uh, we take a look at the current uh, situation and the development uh, stage, it's not sustainable and possible 
in some countries. So my presentation will talk about how to build those uh, building blocks. And the last, um, the, the report highlighted the importance of uh, information data sharing and coordination among ourselves. And I believe that this webinar is uh, one of the, the crucial uh, uh, connector of uh, uh, these information and uh, data sharing and coordination at the global level. So I'm uh, particularly grateful to the organizer of this uh, session to bring us all together. Next slide, please. So let me start with my presentation on what is ITU. I know that some of you come from the ITU background and community, so it may not come as a surprise to you. ITU uh, consists of three uh, distinctive sectors. One is the radio communication, uh, coordinating the radio frequency and allocation of a satellite orbit. Uh, two, there is a standardization a bureau. As uh, Mr. Capin highlighted, uh, these technologies of uh, AI, uh, IoT, blockchain, uh, they need standards to be able to uh, operate and uh, to be used uh, widely in society. So there is this critical function uh, in ITU. And the third is the ITU development sector, which is uh, working on the bridging the digital divide and how to build and put in place these building blocks. Next, please. So um, we have 193 member countries, but we are supported by the industries and academia. And we would, I will talk more about it at the end of this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So we have a footprint globally. As you have seen, in Asia and the Pacific, we have a Bangkok office and Jakarta office, but we are at the moment uh, in the preparation of opening a new area office in Delhi. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. And we cover uh, 38 member countries, uh, the least developed countries uh, uh, seats, the small island developing countries and uh, landlocked countries. So there, uh, the list is uh, uh, highlighted on the slide. Next slide, please. In order to address the digital divide and connecting the half of the population globally, ITU uh, developed this strategy, a five-pronged strategy, growth, uh, the inclusiveness and sustainability, innovation and partnership uh, under the theme of Connect 2030 strategic goals. And my presentation, the activities undertaken and highlighted in my presentation are uh, aligned to one of or two of uh, these uh, uh, elements. Next please, slide, please. Now, before I move on to the, uh, the, the disaster and e-resilience specifically, I would like to also highlight the additional challenges that we face globally, which is the COVID. The United Nations called COVID-19 as the greatest test that we have faced since the formation of the United Nations. And the graph highlights uh, the measures that member countries have taken in the school closure, the restriction of the movement, as well as the lockdown, uh, which were extracted from the uh, Human Development Report of UNDP. And I believe that now gradually we are seeing the magnitude of um, the effect of COVID-19, which affects digital government as well as the uh, disaster risk reduction efforts of member countries. Next slide, please. One of the fundamental building blocks of uh, connecting and uh, uh, enhancing the e-resilience is the connectivity. And as you see on my slide, the network, network infrastructure and services uh, is one of the core uh, mandate and function of ITU uh, to address the digital divide. So for instance, uh, we have uh, work to promote IoT in addition to the standardization, the applications and use cases and capacity development. One of the 
um, emerging areas that we are addressing is the spectrum management in view of the, the introduction of 5Gs. We have been receiving an increasing amount of uh, uh, requests from member countries. And uh, we have different tools such as uh, transmission maps and uh, the, the, the tools, platforms and case studies, among others. Next slide, please. What is also essential to address the topic of this session is the emergency telecommunications. Uh, we have been uh, assisting member countries with, sorry, can you go back to the previous, uh, the development of the emergency tele telecommunication plans, the capacity development and emergency response. I would like to talk about this emergency response and how we assisted the nine Pacific member countries with the emergency telecommunications, which was particularly important for um, under the, the lockdown of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So in this project, uh, we established, if you can uh, run the video, uh, we supported the establishment of the ground stations of, uh, for satellite communications in nine uh, Pacific Island countries. And as you can see uh, the markers, these communities are very uh, uh, remote islands and communities. And um, previously um, in many islands and communities, there were no um, uh, communication facilities. So it was an essential communication lifeline uh, that uh, we established in the, with uh, the partners such as Pacific and Intersat and Imalsat. Next slide, please. So I would like to show some of the photos uh, for the inauguration. In Samoa, uh, we established this uh, satellite uh, ground station in uh, schools of uh, remote islands. And uh, based, because of this uh, uh, satellite connectivity, the high school um, uh, enrollment rates went up after the, the, the project initiated. Next slide, please. And in Vanuatu, um, the inauguration took place in South uh, Malikura uh, Secondary High School, and it was inaugurated by the Prime Minister. Next slide, please. And in Papua New Guinea, uh, we worked very closely with NICTA, National Information and Communication Technology Authority, and uh, to address the, the power supply issue, uh, we uh, came up with the solar power uh, solution to ensure that, that services are available. Next slide, please. What is most important in this project was that uh, there was a typhoon, Harold, which hit the countries in April this year. And the disaster response was particularly difficult because uh, many of the countries that I mentioned were under COVID-19 lockdown. And these islands didn't have uh, other means to communicate, to uh, initiate the, the disaster response. So our satellites, uh, ground stations, and the bandwidths, the, the links, were the only lifeline of communication among these remote islands. So I want to highlight that this connectivity remains the most important perhaps the building blocks to ensure the e-resilience and to make sure that the data and services are available to people in these remote and rural communities. Next slide, please. In addition to the communication and network layer, uh, ITU has been assisting member countries with the application layers and services. Uh, of course, we have a digital government and smart uh, sustainable cities components and Upon that, we have uh, the mobile health, digital finance, and e-agriculture, among others. So we believe that um, these combinations of connectivity and services and applications are essential. Next slide, please. So in addition to the central government part of the digital government, uh, ITU is also supporting the smart cities, smart village and smart islands, which combines and make sure that the services reach the, uh, the, 
beneficiaries in local communities. So smart city, uh, smart village and smart islands uh, built on the, uh, the services developed by the central government, but uh, will tailor to the local needs so that there is a mechanism, capacity and the outreach to communities who will be able to use the services and benefit from it. Next slide, please. And additionally, um, as you know, uh, ITU in partnership with UNICEF has launched a school connectivity initiative called GIGA. Uh, and this initiative is seen uh, particularly important in the context of COVID-19 when uh, uh, a number of our children were left uh, out from school when schools were uh, closed. And uh, these children, uh, many of them were not able to capitalize on the e-learning platforms because of the, the digital divide. So this initiative uh, has been uh, implemented. The, the implementation has started in Africa and in the Cari Caribbean region and now in Asia and the Pacific. Next slide, please. Additionally, uh, I would like to add one more uh, layer of importance to all of us, which is the cyber security and child online protection. Because when the disaster and crisis hit the country, it's the time that we are most vulnerable. And as you have seen, uh, there were an increase in cyber attacks. So uh, in conjunction with the other uh, support that I just described, ITU has been uh, enhancing the support to national cybersecurity strategy, CERT, and cyber drills, uh, among others, so as to protect the essential infrastructure and services at the time of crisis. Next slide, please. So, in this segregated form, uh, these are some of the services that uh, um, we have been uh, providing in Asia and the Pacific in particular, but globally. Next slide, please. And um, just to also highlight that this digital inclusion and the capacity de development is uh, an essential component to support the users who would be able to take advantage of the, the e-government as well as e-resilience services. So for that, uh, we have different tools such as digital skills toolkits, uh, assessment guidelines, and child online protection guidelines, and the, uh, uh, the safe listening and devices and systems toolkits. Next slide, please. And more essentially, uh, ITU has a capacity uh, building program called ITU Academy, which is uh, supported by a center of excellence and the different programs such as the digital transformation center that uh, ITU has established with, uh, with Cisco systems. Next slide, please. So in Asia and the Pacific, there are six centers of excellence, which provide the technical training and uh, uh, capacity building uh, courses. And there are uh, courses all the time. So I would like to encourage the participants to join us and to get to know the technical details as well as the functionalities of these frontier technologies that uh, Mr. Kapin uh, mentioned. So these includes the uh, centers in India, China, uh, Iran, uh, Republic of Korea, and uh, again, China and the Philippines. So, uh, sorry, uh, Indonesia. And uh, I believe that uh, these will be the uh, essential building blocks to take it forward to the next step. Next slide, please. So these uh, activities would not be possible uh, without the uh, private sector and academia uh, participation. And as you see, we have a number of uh, uh, industry uh, members and academia members uh, who are supporting. So I would like to encourage 
the uh, participants who are from the industry as well as academia and civil society to join us. We have uh, joint and collaborative activities with many of them. And I believe that one of the participants uh, asked the role uh, of uh, uh, industry uh, to bridge the digital divide. And I'll be happy to answer with the concrete examples, if I have time. Uh, next slide, please. And the next slide highlights the academia, the list of uh, uh, academia uh, members. Next slide, please. So more concretely, uh, if you are interested in some of these activities of ITU, we have an, uh, these uh, events in September and October specific to uh, IoT, 5G, uh, blockchain, as well as um, the cybersecurity. I believe that, sorry, the, the slide may be a little bit blurred, but I hope that the organizer will share with you um, the, the slides. The next slide, please. And next slide is the uh, October activities. And this continues. Uh, in uh, November too. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for your uh, patience and attention. Uh, these are the uh, QR code to our Twitter account and uh, the LinkedIn. And I'll be happy to uh, provide any additional information for uh, the participants who may want to ask uh, specific questions as well as overall questions. So thank you, uh, Mr. Dana, for giving me this opportunity. Han uh, back to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Okuda, for such a detailed and a brilliant presentation. I particularly noticed your presentation also highlighted that in order to be able to close the digital divide, it, re it requires partnership, uh, global cooperation, leadership and innovation, especially in finance and technology. And that digital, the digital economy is creating many opportunities around the globe. But if we do not address the digital gap, uh, we are also creating a huge shortage of people with the necessary digital skills to support it. So I would like to thank you once again for such a brilliant presentation. Our next presenter is um, Ms. Erin Ife, and she'll be delivering her presentation on big data analytics for DRR, or Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience. Uh, Dr. Ife serves as the Director of uh, Global Operations for the Pacific Disaster Center. For over two decades, she has uh, dedicated her academic and professional career for advancing evidence-based practices in the field of disaster management. She has a career that spans both uh, in the front lines and senior most levels of national and international disaster management. And this focuses on building um, the next generation of disaster risk professionals. Uh, she serves as a, a faculty at Georgetown University in the, the disaster and emergency management program. Dr. Hufe, the floor is yours. Aloha and good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Erin Huey, and as they mentioned, I'm with the Pacific Disaster Center. So for those of you that aren't familiar with us, we are located in Hawaii, so good evening from here. Um, and we have a global mission. Next slide. And our mission really is to foster resilience and to do that using the best science and technology and bringing the best available data into the hands of the executive disaster managers worldwide in an effort to reduce risk, improve our response capabilities, and ultimately to save lives. So in my presentation this evening, I'm really going to show you what we can do today and how big data and advanced analytics has made that possible. You know, big data and advanced analytics should not be something that we're looking to the future for. It is something that's here today and that we're leveraging. And so I really wanna shine a light on what's, what's possible globally with that information. Next. 
So as I mentioned, PDC um, really began in 1992 when Hurricane Aniki destroyed the island of Kauai here in Hawaii. And uh, in the previous presentation, we, we saw a lot about developing states and small island nations. And at the time, um, Hawaii also did not have access to some of the same critical information about the storms and potential impacts. So we said, you know, we need to be bringing the best science and technology into the hand of the practitioner on the ground. And so we've committed ourselves to that. We've got over eight global offices. Uh, we're a small staff, but we have hundreds of projects that are ongoing right now. And we provide real-time data and information to over 19 hazards globally. Next. So how do we do that? Well, we really do try and build that bridge. And we know in the scientific community, we, being an academic myself, uh, love those peer reviewed journals, but it takes a long time to get there. And our, our confidence with uncertainty is very low in the academic, uh, academic space. We use very complex terminology and we love to work in technical groups. However, on the other hand, the emergency manager on the ground at every level really needs to have quick information that they can easily understand, easily make decisions on without being a seismologist or, or a volcanologist or, or a meteorologist for that matter, or having a degree in sociology. Um, so we really need to take this complex data and information get it into the hands of the decision makers who have to make decisions regardless of the data that's in front of them in order to save lives. And so that's been our focus here for, for many years. Next slide. So how do we do that? Well, these five questions, I always really like focusing on these five questions because I think when you change the tense of the question, it can apply to any of the phases of emergency manager. So not only do I need to know what could happen, but I also need to know what is happening. I need to know where could it happen, but I need to know where did it happen? How bad is it? Who's vulnerable? And what do I need to do? And when I say I, that might be an NGO, that might be a high level decision maker, that might be a private industry, or that might be the citizen. And so our focus has really been to provide the same information in easily digestible forms across the spectrum. Next. So how do we do that? And I saw somebody ask the question, how good does your data need to be? And where do you bring that data from in, in some of the Q&A questions? Well, that's been our focus is how good does the data need to be? We've really looked to bring in data from a variety of sources. In an earlier presentation, we talked about remote sensing and satellite data. We do that. We talked about hazard advisories that were coming in from the USGS, but also from data coming from emergency managers around the world, like BNPB in Indonesia. Um, we also bring together that social me media and local news media. And uh, I think there was also a question of, well, what do we do with fake news or, or poor information? Um, when we are able to bring together the right amount of data from a variety of sources, we're actually able to triangulate that data. We're able to very quickly say, did this happen? Is this real? And not only are the remote sensed or um, data related to the sensing of the hazard important, but we're now able to com compare that to what somebody is saying on Twitter on the ground, or what is this emergency management agency reporting, and combine that with many of these advanced modeling capabilities to tell us then what happened, where did it happen, how bad is it, and what do I need to do, and ultimately create actionable risk intelligence, because that's what we want to do. It's great if we can identify an earthquake, but we need to translate that to we have an earthquake, we have 75% of the city 
that needs to have response. We have major damage in the following sector and we need to get urban search and rescue teams there. That's our first line of defense and we need to do that quickly. So I'm gonna show you really how we're able to do this and how we're able to combine the right level of data across the board and the difference between accurate and precise data. So next slide. So one of the main ways we do this is through our disaster aware platform, which is free and available to, to everybody. And it's also multilingual. Uh, if you have your phone on you, you can look up disaster alert and uh, be able to download this. And these slides over here on the left actually are depicting the storms and the hazards in the region as of yesterday. Um, but not only do we need the data, we need to bring that data together in integrated modeling. And so what you're seeing is not only the location of the hazard, but the anticipated uh, wind speed of, of that storm. And with COVID, we're also now bringing in secondary and tertiary hazard types that might complicate a response. And we do that through advanced analytic reporting, situation reports, and bringing in population level data. Next. So the foundation, and uh, I showed you a few slides back, we had remote sensing data, we had hazard data coming from a variety of agencies and organizations. We take that data and then we combine it with PDC's risk and vulnerability data. And we have this at multiple levels. One, we have our global risk and vulnerability assessment that we do and provide reports and data on. But we also have a program called the National Disaster Preparedness Baseline Assessment. And this assessment, we're on track to have over 20% of the world covered by 2021. And here's an example from Vietnam, um, where we look at data at a very detailed sub-national level so that we can start to address risks using large amounts of data at a very local scale. This allows all of the agencies and organizations active in disaster management to target their investment. If our goal is truly to reduce vulnerability, increase coping capacity, and support our most vulnerable populations, we need to do that with not only accurate but precise data. Next slide. So inside these reports, we're taking a look at the overall risk and vulnerability at a subnational level. And this might vary from country to country, and that is a challenge with big data and good solid data at a country level. So we can't go down necessarily to the city block but we are able to go to municipalities or to a district or to a province, depending on the country, and look at things like the coping capacity, the disaster management capabilities, which is something that's really unique to PDC, understanding the resilience, and that resilience hazard independent. So not just in response to a wildfire or a tsunami, but what does it mean in the context of COVID? And I'm gonna show you how we leverage this resilience data and this hazard independent data for things like COVID. But then we combined it, and if you see in the bottom right corner, disaster management analysis. So these two things many times have been divorced of one another. The disaster management structure has been divorced of the the risk and vulnerability. And what we're trying to do is bring these pieces together for effective decision making. Next slide. And we're doing it not alone because nobody can really overcome big data and the need for accurate data alone, but leveraging with really good partners. So for example, OpenStreetMap and uh, Petabenchana in Indonesia, but using smart devices, drones, apps to collect and gather data and then triangulate it with hazard specific data or data that's known. And then mapping that effectively so that when a disaster happens or as we start to model more and more the impacts of climate change, really be able to understand what the impact will be and what actions we can take today, ultimately to reduce losses and save lives. Next. So let's talk about some really uh, interesting ways that that's been happening today. 
this is an example from 2018, but we're also responding to fires in California today. Many of you might have seen this. Um, but taking the data that we have and PDC's advanced modeling capability, what we're able to do is take the big data and do some advanced modeling using expert systems to determine what is the total population of the burned or um, yeah, the burned area. And then also what are the households exposed? What does that population look like very quickly? And also be able to say, you know, is this residential or social or service sector, hospitals, schools that are in this area? And this is something that used to take days or weeks that we can now do in seconds or minutes. And so that is the big plus of, of having big data and having the necessary tools and models to run it, is that this is something we can do now, today, when an event happens. Next. Another great example of this is how we're triangulating really data coming from the media, and that might be traditional news media, which is what I'm showing you here right now, but also from social media like Twitter. So by able, being able to triangulate this data very effectively, what we're doing is we're not only relying just on the agency that issues that warning, but we're also then able to find out, you know, how many people are in, injured. Uh, what does this mean for folks on the ground? What type of resources do we need to see? And we were able to do this a little bit in Nepal in 2015, leveraging social media, but we've just been able to refine it over the next, or the past five years to a point where it's really leading to action. Next slide, please. And so, I always want to be able to show how we're using the technology and the real time data. And this is a hazard and earthquake 6 4 and um, that that happened in, uh, I believe, California and very quickly not using anything but big data our advanced analytics and within seconds, we were able to tell you what the affected population is the severity. But then you also see this machine description. This is, you know, AI where, where we're actually writing the description, pulling this together, and then using the um, expert systems as well to identify the capital exposure. So as a decision maker, when an event happens, if you're instantly able to have this information in your hand and it's being refined continuously, you can see how this will really start to jump our capabilities in effectively responding. Now place this in the environment of COVID that we're in today and you can really see the need for it. We're not able to get folks on the ground to do assessments. We need to be able to assess the potential impacts early and be able to really limit the resources, including the people that would be on the ground that could potentially either introduce COVID or then be exposed to it. Next slide. And then I just want to show you a few other, being mindful of time, just a few other um, a few other examples. So this is one of the ways that we're doing this, being able to automatically look at the impacts of Lifeline. This, this is uh, Super Typhoon Mancoot. And we were able to, with every single advisory, instantly refine this data and put this data out so that you can understand population and households affected, but also potential impacts to communication power and transportation. Next. Here's just another example. Uh, in, I'll just go to the next slide in the interest of time. Oh, back one. Thank you. Now, I, I talked about not being able to do this alone. And so over the last two years, we've worked very closely with UNOCHA and World Food Program to also leverage the amazing amount of data that they have into a project uh, or a product called JADE, Joint Analysis of Disaster Exposure. So with every disaster that's happening, we're able to collectively bring our unique data sets together and run the analysis. Um, and what this is telling us is you'll look in the top left corner and you see 5 million uh, people potentially exposed, but we know that that's not what we'll be responding to. So in that area, we see that we have 1.6 million 
that are going to be significantly impacted and are in poverty. And just under 100,000, though, that are going to be of the most vulnerable. Um, and of those, this is the water, food, refuse that would be required. So you're really getting to specifics on it. Next slide. And then because we have this big data and analytics, I just wanted to share this last slide and say, you know, the same data and information is able to be quickly pulled for every country globally. And so within a day um, of us realizing that we really were facing something unique with this pandemic, we ran for every country globally the planning guidelines to understand what their risks and vulnerabilities were, but also what their global healthcare capacity was uh, to support our partners. Next slide. I know I went a few minutes over time, but I really thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak and to hear the other presenters. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Erin, for such a practically oriented and insightful presentation. Uh, I would like to just highlight a few points that you mentioned. One was that big data analytics is contributing to make information more meaningful, especially for decision making and building resilience for the vulnerable in a safer world. And how your center does PDC is contributing to or enabling more effective prioritization of risk reduction and resilience building initiatives. We applaud you for that. I will now move to our next section, which will focus on the two country cases. The first country case on Japan is going to be delivered by Mr. Endo. Mr. Endo is the director of the UN Center for Regional Development based in Japan. Prior to joining UNCRD, he was the deputy director general of the Great East Japan Earthquake Reconstruction Project in a reconstruction project and also uh, the agency of cabinet secretary. His career in Japan covers or spans over 10 uh, engineering positions at government headquarters, the National Highway Management Office, and local authorities. And he was also transferred from JICA, that's and the World Bank, as a senior highway engineer, transport and ICT global practice for Africa. Uh, he is a satisfied uh, professional engineer in Japan and, uh, and an APEC engineer. Mr. Endo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dana, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, my presentation discussed uh, real practice in Japan. My presentation consists of three content. Uh, one, IT for large scale earthquake. And the second topic, uh, IT for large scale flooding disaster. And then finally, I <clears throat> provide some uh, policy recommendations. Next, please. So, uh, <clears throat> Dana uh, provided an uh, introduction uh, of my career. So, this is, um, you know, the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. Many of you know uh, this just as a uh, number of deaths and missing as a result of earthquake and tsunami is total 18,000 people. So next, please. So from here, I uh, discuss uh, some examples uh, of uh, using uh, information and the data uh, for disaster risk reduction. So this is uh, example one utilization of social network um, <coughs> SNS. So the slide shows uh, how SNS data can be uh, used uh, to reduce uh, disaster risk. So this is just a process uh, of data uh, management. Uh, first, we collect uh, the disaster information from SIP containing uh, disaster keywords. And then uh, second, uh, the remove uh, information that's not relevant to disasters. And then the estimate uh, where the remarks come from. And finally, the disasters can be speculated by checking sharp increase 
in disaster related trees. Especially if this is very uh, effective, especially when the disasters are large scale, like earthquake and tsunami. Next, please. <clears throat> and uh, another example is uh, the use of uh, mobile phone location data. So um, the <coughs> location uh, data is very useful for evacuation. Just please uh, imagine a big earthquake, like uh, the <coughs> a big earthquake in 2011 in northern part of Japan. Uh, for example, we could estimate number of people who have difficulty, difficulty returning home in each prefecture after earthquake, which uh, cause suspension of public transportation. This is the story in metropolitan area. Uh, you know that the earthquake happened in northern part of Japan, but to, uh, affect uh, even metropolitan uh, area far from northern part of Japan. This is how data is utilized. Next, please. So uh, another uh, example is uh, the uh, sharing uh, safety information. So it helps uh, confirming the people's movement and uh, safety of people by utilizing mobile phone data. So the, <coughs> the sharing uh, uh, location information between family members are very important. Uh, this system allows us uh, to share the location uh, information of uh, children. So when the earthquake uh, is uh, very large, for example, the seismic intensity is uh, stronger than five. So those are uh, the example uh, when the earthquake and the tsunami. So next, please. So from now, uh, I um, provide uh, some uh, case uh, uh, for the flooding uh, disaster. So every year, uh, Japan are faced with uh, uh, flooding. Um, so last year, uh, we uh, faced we were faced with uh, a very large scale uh, flooding. Uh, we call it uh, a typhoon Higgins. The, the the lower right side. This is a picture of a typhoon. This is a larger, much, much larger than a ordinary a typhoon. So that affects a very large areas in Japan. So next, please. So the, this uh, a Higibis a typhoon uh, <clears throat> so caused uh, so many uh, you know, damage. This is the location of river banks uh, which destroyed. So uh, the, the <coughs> location of damage uh, 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 so many, uh, so many, uh, not only uh, metropolitan area and the surrounding areas. So next, please. Um, this is uh, uh, one notable uh, disaster consequences. Uh, so the Shinkansen bullet train uh, was soaked in the flooding water. So uh, that's uh, the disaster consequence uh, last year. Actually, the, uh, from, uh, <clears throat> until uh, yesterday, uh, the, the typhoon uh, came, but the, unfortunately, uh, not uh, much uh, damage uh, occurred. So next, please. So now I'm going to uh, explain uh, the IT, uh, <clears throat> IT technology for a large scale flooding. So this uh, is a, a big data can be utilized uh, to estimate uh, damages from uh, flooding. So first, uh, the <coughs> you know, flood, uh, flood uh, forecasting uh, is conducted by automatically setting uh, parameter values. Uh, so it's a kind of artificial uh, intelligence. So because nowadays uh, the flooding uh, you know, occurred very suddenly, um, so the, the forecast uh, came from uh, mar uh, the news media so uh, the most severe case, just uh, two or three uh, hours later, uh, real you know, uh, damage uh, uh, happened. So uh, then uh, second, uh, the, the topographic data uh, can stimulate uh, the flood uh, spread or disaster consequences as a result of broken uh, river banks. So that uh, rapid uh, the, the estimation is very important in Japan because 
um, you know, the, the damage and the, the uh, disaster consequence, uh, consequence uh, come very rapidly. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the examples. So the next, please. <coughs> So this is um, the uh, again utilization of uh, weather data. Uh, this is utilized for uh, uh, railway uh, operation. So the the, <coughs> the utilization of big data. Uh, th this is for not only flooding but landslide disasters uh, caused by heavy rain. So first utilization of weather data um, help. Uh, estimates the amount of rainfall along the uh, railway uh, operated by uh, the railway company. Um, so this system monitor the risk of sediment related uh, disasters up to uh, six hours. Here uh, figure uh, only shows uh, uh, up to two hours, but uh, it's also uh, very useful for uh, management of uh, railway structures. So next please. <clears throat> so uh, until now, I provide uh, some real case uh, <coughs> case practice uh, of IT technology. Uh, so now I conclude. I provide uh, a policy uh, recommendation. So uh, I believe uh, disaster risk reduction uh, should be addressed in a very comprehensive manner. So that means any uh, risk management uh, practices shall align, align with uh, ISO uh, 31000, that's the uh, risk management guidelines. This is uh, a framework uh, of risk management. So first, um, you know, na uh, national and local uh, context are defined, and then risk evaluation are conducted and the risk uh, treatment uh, will be done. It's a kind of PDCA plan to check uh, actions. So I uh, explained uh, uh, five examples. For example, uh, the utilization of SNS is uh, very relevant uh, to the left, uh, left, uh, left hand side of uh, communication. Uh, so first I explained the uh, relevant to uh, uh, each of uh, your component of um, the <coughs> ISO 31000. So next please. So then uh, I um, provide uh, some uh, reference material. So this is a, a load geohazard risk management handbook. Uh, this uh, proposed a, a comprehensive framework for a, a disaster risk reduction. Uh, so the, this handbook is very uh, relevant uh, to the topic of this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, actually, uh, I'm one of the uh, authors of this handbook. Uh, this uh, handbook published uh, the, the just a couple of uh, months ago. I recommend the participants uh, to go through uh, those documents. Uh, that includes not only a handbook, but uh, a case study document, uh, including Japan, Brazil, and Serbia. Uh, it's very uh, good to know, uh, uh, you know, the what is disaster risk reduction and building resilience. So finally, I thank uh, participants and uh, thank my colleagues helping my presentation. Uh, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Dana. Thank you very much, Mr. Endo, for an uh, ins insightful presentation with great examples from Japan. I would like to emphasize some of the key points you mentioned, which are very important on how the utilization of uh, weather data is helping to predict and manage disasters and is automatically setting a highly predictive parameter for managing disasters in Japan, which could be applied to other regions. And you also emphasize how the utilization of uh, social networking systems or services and other, other um, ICT tools are helping in sharing safety information for including an early emergency warning system. And we appreciate your very insightful presentation. I would now like to move to our last but not least presentation for this session. And it's going to be delivered, it's a country case on the Philippines, and it's going to be delivered by Dr. Ebenezer Florano. Dr. Florano is a professor at the University of the Philippines and uh, at the National College of Public Administration and Governance. And he's a former director of its Center for Policy and Executive Development. 
Dr. Florano teaches policy analysis, research methods in public administration, and climate change adaptation, including disaster risk reduction at the graduate school and at the undergraduate level. He has published widely on uh, environmental governance, including climate change and disaster risk. He holds a PhD in public administration from the International Christian University, Tokyo, Japan. Mr. Dr. Florano, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can hear you very clearly. Okay. Okay, so this is a, uh, a, a presentation on digitalized disaster risk reduction services uh, towards building national resilience, uh, focus on the nationwide operational assessment of hazards or NOAA. Um, just um, uh, introduce that this is an um, excerpt from the uh, longer paper on digitalization of public service delivery by the Asian Productivity Organization and the Development Academy of the Philippines. Next slide. Next slide, please. So briefly, I'll be talking about disasters in the Philippines immediately on the NOAA and then conclusions. Next slide. So the Philippines is prone to weather-related and, and other natural geological uh, events, mainly because we are in the Pacific Rim of Fire. So, uh, and then there are around 20 typhoons which visit the country. So every year we have uh, hundreds, of uh, hundreds of casualties and injuries and also uh, billions of money uh, due to loss and damages to the economy, to infrastructure, to agriculture, to tourism, etc. And um, this is uh, uh, one of the reasons is that it, there's a lack of awareness on extreme natural hazard events and their disastrous effects. So you can see our um, map here. You can see the seismic, um, um, hydrometeorological, volcanic uh, uh, e events that occur in the Philippines. So you can see uh, most of the country is painted in red because of the natural disasters. Next slide, please. So uh, we have many um, disaster related uh, government agencies that produce weather data, tsunami data, flooding data, storm surge data, landslide data, earthquake data. Uh, so you can see that they are all scattered in so many government agencies. And uh, there are many problems with regard to the production of this data and the utilization. Okay, so in the production, we don't have much of the gadgets, the technology, the devices to generate um, uh, the data for uh, disaster risk reduction. And even if we have those data, they are sometimes obsolete or no longer updated, and they are hard to, uh, to be accessed. So it's hard to use them when um, a, disaster, uh, yeah, a disaster will strike the country. So th we had those difficulties before. Next slide, please. So in 2011, there was this uh, big uh, typhoon, Typhoon Washi International uh, in December 2011. And uh, this was, I think, the last straw. So the government, the national government then created NOAA, which is Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards. So it was created in 2012, July 2012, by the Department of Science and Technology. It is the flagship program of the previous administration from 2010 to 2016 and supported by DRR related national government agencies, local governments, business establishments, media, NGOs, business, uh, foreign governments, and international financing institutions. Next slide, please. So the, the goal is to make the country resilient. And the objectives are to provide more accurate, integrated, and responsive disaster prevention and mitigation systems, especially in high-risk areas throughout the country. And to do that, uh, we have to harness technologies and management services for DRR offered by DRR and related national government agencies in partnership with institutes from the University of the Philippines. I think this could answer already the question about how to involve the, uh, the academia in BRR. Next slide, please. 
So um, the project NOAA, so it's a project, it, came, um, it, was it was supported by a big amount of budget and it was able to buy, uh, to buy the gadgets, the technologies, the devices needed to, uh, to uh, come up with landslide uh, maps, with coastal hazard maps, with flood information maps, with weather information uh, integration for system enhancement, for disaster management using WebGIS. So th there were these layerings of maps uh, for uh, using WebGIS, and then uh, uh, gadgets for uh, like weather sensors, and then to communicate uh, the, the data that were, uh, that were generated and the maps that were produced from these data gathering uh, gadgets. Okay, so these were uh, distributed through um, uh, SMS or texting, uh, social media, through uh, radio, television. And then the use of social science and natural science in disaster risk and exposure assessment for mitigation because there is a need to know the culture of people, how to bring about effective changes in the reactions of people towards disasters. So it's not just about natural science, but social science must be also be included in disaster risk reduction and management. Next slide, please. So uh, by the end of 2016, we were able, the, the, the project NOAA was able to produce hazard maps, multi-hazard maps, new hazard maps, LIDAR maps, storm surge maps, and maps for the greater Manila area. Okay, and these were shared to all government agencies, uh, also to the, to the people, so that they will know what are the impending disasters, what are the hazards in their areas. Next slide, please. So this short video will tell you how early warning system was uh, activated using the, 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 the data, the, the maps that were generated by Project Map. Please uh, play the video for two minutes. <laughs> Project NOAA has developed an early warning system that will allow users to see and monitor incoming weather disturbances. These tools give people the ability to make informed decisions as they are able to determine the dangers and risks a hazard can bring. The animated images from the Himawari satellite allow users to monitor storms that may enter the Philippine area of responsibility. The satellite image shows the size of the storm and the direction where it is headed. It can also show rain clouds which can indicate areas where it will rain. Given that a certain community experiences rainfall, Project NOAA is also able to monitor the amount of rain because the Doppler radar stations accurately display the coverage of the rain clouds. Thus, areas where it might rain are effectively marked out. If there is continuous heavy rainfall in the identified areas, the automated rain gauges in the upper parts of the watershed gather and record the amount of rainfall over a set period of time. If the sensors continue to display continuous rainfall, the next step is to check out the water level sensors. These sensors indicate the rise and fall of a river's water level. Continuous rainfall in the highlands make the river swell. You can use the water level sensors to detect whether or not a river is about to overflow. If the graph shows a continuous rise of water, then there is already a likelihood for flooding. All these sensors help LGU officials know how much time remains before the potentially damaging landslide or flash flood hits their community. To know which areas will be hit by landslides, flooding, or storm surges, you can check the hazard maps that are also in the Project NOAA website. The early warning systems combine the resources of several agencies of the Department of Science and Technology. This is to effectively highlight... Next slide, please. Okay, so it shows you the use of big data from a satellite, from Doppler uh, machines, from sensors, from rain gauges. So um, they, uh, they use this data to give a, a six hour early warning to areas which will be affected by those hazards. So were they, effect, uh, were they effective, this early warning system? So you can see here in the, in the timeline of averted potential disasters versus failed disaster management between 1999 and 2015, the, the ones in the blue shades are those which were uh, disasters averted and the one in the pink shades are those which failed 
and these are mostly about flood, uh, landslide, and storm surges. So you can see that before 2012, before NOAA was created, most of the uh, disasters uh, took place. So you can see there the, 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 the year, the name of the storms, for example, the landslide that occurred or the, the flood that occurred and then the deaths, number of deaths. So uh, most of them were in, are in the pink areas. So the, 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 uh, these are the failed disasters. But after uh, 2012, when the pre-disaster pre risk assessment was institutionalized, most of the disasters were already, were already in the blue areas. It, it means that they were averted or stopped. Next slide, please. So because of the efforts, next slide, please. Because of the efforts of Project NOAA, they were awarded uh, several uh, uh, accommodations from uh, international groups and from the lo local or domestic uh, groups. So it is a multi-awarded project. But next slide, please. But uh, uh, Project NOAA was turned over in 2017 back to the Department of Science and Technology. So um, in, in a way, uh, most of the functions were given back to the, uh, uh, the national government. And you can see from 2017 onwards, most of the disasters were already in the pink area. That means they were no longer averted or stopped. So there were more occurrences of disasters uh, uh, from 2017 onwards, and uh, according to the former director of Project NOAA, the mass casualties from 2017 onwards happened due to the shift from hazard-specific area focus and time-bound warnings to general warnings. So this occurred after it was turned over to the national government agencies. Next slide, please. Uh, so Project NOAA was created in 2012, and um, it was terminated in 2017, but luckily the University of the Philippines adopted the personnel, the staff of Project NOAA, so it's no longer Project NOAA, it's, it's already called UPNOAA, but the Department of Science and Technology and other allied agencies continued the, the the, uh, the, the, the products and the technologies that were created by Project NOAA, so they created Hazard Hunter. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, uh, com comparing UP NOAA, uh, UP NOAA is now based at the University of the Philippines. It produces scenario-based maps for early warning, hazard-specific area focus, and time-bound warnings. Next slide, please. And the national government has this hazard hunter, which produces multi-hazard assessments for seismic, volcanic, and hydrometeorological hazards. So uh, it's more general. It's uh, the, 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 the products of hazard hunter. It is also given to the general public for, uh, to prepare themselves for disaster risk reduction and management. So last slide. So in conclusion, digitalization, digitization, and big data uh, uh, analytics offer opportunities to innovate in DRR. In this case study, it has been shown that they enable people to prevent, prepare for, and respond to potential disaster. However, commensurate institutional reforms in the bureaucracy must be established so that the full potentials of digitalized DRR could be harnessed towards building a resilient country. We might have the best uh, technology and the best uh, gadgetries, but then we must also have, we, we must uh, prepare the bureaucracy also to be more proactive in giving warning to the people so that they can prepare for possible disasters. With that, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Florano, for an inspiring presentation. I think your uh, presentation further highlighted, especially our understanding of Project NOAA and how the early warning system is helping and empowering communities to monitor incoming crisis for informed decisions to achieve resilience. Uh, you also ended by letting us know that digitalization, digitization, and big data analytics offers unique opportunities to innovate in disaster risk reduction. Thank you once again. So we now move to the next section on question and answer and discussion. And this section will be moderated by my colleague, Mr. Kepin Yao. And I would now like to hand over 
the bottom to him. Captain, the floor okay, is thank yours. Thank you, Dana. Yeah. Okay, dear colleagues, friends, I hope uh, you have so far enjoyed the presentation about the speakers. I'm happy to inform you that uh, most of the questions uh, that uh, um, posted during the presentation times uh, are most answered. So now we only have op only one open question. So then after this kind of open question, we can um, open the floor for our um, uh, participants for, uh, yeah, for, any, for any question you may have. So for the question that we have from uh, Mr. Kaha Nadi Radiza, his question, uh, question is about, can we combine the only warning systems with ArcGIS Geo Platform for better predictive multinational, multi-dimensional multi platforms, right? So for this question, it's very specific to DRR. So may I invite uh, uh, my colleague from UNDR, Ms. Sarah, to answer this question. Sarah, can you answer this question? Sarah is here. Hi, thank you. Um, apologies for the delay. So you're asking if we can combine early warning systems with ArcGIS and Geo platforms for better predictive multi-dimensional platforms. And I have to admit, I'm not an expert in this technological area. Um, so thank you for, for directing the, the question to us. Of course, early warning systems are an essential uh, component of uh, disaster risk reduction and the policy objective to reduce disaster risk through communicating uh, and, and timely and effective warnings. Um, and of course, there are challenges in reaching uh, even to the last mile where technology, uh, both high technology and low tech um, support. Um, I would like to see if there might be any panelists with more specific um, technological background that might like to add uh, in answering to this question. Um, perhaps uh, Dr. Huey, I think. Thank you, Aaron. Huey, go ahead. Apologies, okay, uh, I, it's hard to unmute myself there, but that's actually a really great question. And um, at PDC, we actually do bridge those two. I, I think what we're seeing is that not only with the ArcGIS, but there are a lot of QGIS, a lot of GIS platforms, and a lot of advanced analytic capability. You see that in Tableau and in multiple software packages. And I think what's really important to realize is that for early warning, it's critical that we leverage the best technology out there and that we pull each of those pieces in and combine it. So what we do is we actually do use GIS, ArcGIS, Geo, and the Geo servers, the advanced data, but we also use Tableau for advanced analytics. So I think it is one of um, one of the many important pieces that need to need to be brought together for advanced um, early warning. And I think when we talk about early warning, we also need to think about all hazards and not sending people to a hundred different systems, but how do we make it really focused so that it's something that they do every day and that it becomes part of their, their natural norm, just like you going to Twitter, or Facebook, or something else. So um, maybe I'll, I'll stop there and see if there are others that would like to respond. Okay, so thank you, Ori, yeah. So now, I mean, uh, I would like to open the floor to our uh, participants. If you may have any questions, you can now push your question on the Q&A boxes, or you can uh, request to speak. No. <laughs> or if uh, the participants for those questions that we already answered you, if you're not happy or think the answer is not uh, complete, you can also raise the question again here. So if no more questions, Okay, 
if at this time you don't have any questions, you can raise this question and uh, communicate it with us through the email, or you can post that question in the uh, workspace. Yeah, we can further discuss those questions you may have. So if no more questions from the floor at this moment. So I will hand over the floor to Dana. Dana. Yes, Captain. Okay, I think um, most of the presentations were very insightful. That's why we did it. And the response behind the scene also helped the participants get answers to their questions. So thank you very much, Captain, for moderating this section. And uh, I would like to move to the next section uh, where we invite our colleague to present on uh, next or give an introductory presentation on next week's uh, topic, which will be on strengthening governance and leveraging technologies for public uh, health emergencies. So I would like to invite our colleague, uh, Ms. Anna Tolan. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dana. Good afternoon, everyone. And greetings from UNDRR, Office for Northeast Asia and Global Education and Training Institute in Korea. We are going to introduce you to session five. Uh, we're going to look and focus on strengthening governance and leveraging technologies for public health emergencies. Next, please. The session will base on the governance and the lessons from managing SARS, other health emergencies like SARS, MERS, Ebola, and share practical experience from countries on how they have been using ITC to tackle COVID-19. Dr. Erin already has introduced a little bit on the next week's session, looking at how this information has been meaningful for decision making. We we'll also look at the health aspects of the Sendai framework, and we will provide the specific tools that can help countries to better prepare for future pandemics. These are the health emergency and disaster risk management framework, and the disaster resilience scorecard for cities, a public health systems resilient addendum, which is specifically for city level, and how they can integrate the health sector and the disaster risk management sector to deal with pandemics. Next, please. So the structure of the session, we will have three parts. The first part will consist in presentations from colleagues from the UN and also guest speakers. The second part will be a presentation specifically on the scorecard health addendum. And we will have some time for group work. And for that, I kindly request you to please download the public health scorecard addendum. The, the link is in the chat. My colleagues are going to put in the chat. And the idea is that you will do some time to also meet each other and discuss this public health sector and tool. And uh, the result of this discussion will be, uh, we would like that you upload either in the workspace or send to us by email. Next, please. So after the, the session, what we aim is that participants will be able to identify policy considerations to reduce risk and the consequence of public health emergencies and disasters, recognize the concepts, the guiding principles, and the functions for effective health emergency and a disaster risk management integration, and better understand the use of ICT, digital governance, governance, data intelligence platforms in tackling COVID-19 and use this information for decision making. Over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for such a concise but informative uh, introductory presentation for next week. I would now like to announce to all participate participants and speakers that we are going to have a short poll, which will be a quiz in the form of a poll, which will be on your screen. Kindly take a few minutes to just submit, uh, just click on the right answer based on, so currently we have the first question and I would like to invite you to kindly submit your answer to the first question, which is on your screen at the moment. I hope we are answering. So the results will be done quickly and we can all see how the quiz goes. You can see the answers rolling in. 
for all three questions. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, we are almost done and we'll be ending the poll soon. Okay, the polls are about to close. Maybe one more minute, Dana. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Okay, so we'll be ending in five seconds. Uyong, can you kindly close the polls? Okay, so we have the results on our screen and uh, the correct answers are highlighted in uh, the red or oh, orange, yes. So I think the results will also be shared on the workspace and uh, other details will be done there. Uh, we are also supposed to, we are kindly requesting participants to try to answer our survey question which is shared. This is supposed to help us better understand your needs and also know how much we're faring in organizing this six week long uh, workshop and any other suggestions you have for improvement. And we also invite you to especially try to participate in our workspace where the discussion is ongoing. If you go back and you have any other question which is specific to this section, you may let us know and we are ready to continue engaging with you. So without much ado, in closing, I would like to take this opportunity again to thank you all speakers and participants for your insightful presentation and active engagement, especially through the chat box. And, and we'd like you to accept our sincerest appreciation and we invite you to join the ongoing discussion on the web space, as I mentioned. I would like to say, have a wonderful week and see you next week. Thank you very much and have a good day, good night, good afternoon. Bye-bye.